Thank you for joining us today, and welcome to this month's webinar, Asia in the Next Decade. I'm Dana Nelson, Portfolio Manager here at Bell Investment Advisors, and with me today I have a very special guest, Andrew Foster, Portfolio Manager at Matthews International Capital Management. Andrew's been with Matthews since 1998, and as I said, is currently a Portfolio Manager. At the end of today's presentation, as always, we will allow about five minutes for questions and answers. To submit questions, please use the question box in the upper right-hand corner of your GoToMeeting control panel. If you're having any technical difficulties today, we recommend you simply call our office at 800-700-0089. For today, we're going to start by giving a very brief overview of Bell Investment Advisors, as we do have a few updates, and then we'll give an overview of Matthews International Capital Management Group. We'll follow up by handing the discussion over to Andrew, and he'll explain what is decoupling, or answer that question. He'll give some historical experience of decoupling, followed by three essential pillars as we look into the future, and we'll wrap up with some cautionary outlook towards, in particular, the short-term expectations. And then finally, as I mentioned a moment ago, we'll have some of your questions answered. So just briefly, at Bell Investment Advisors, we have a vision for momentum for life. Specifically, we believe that we can build momentum through investment management, financial planning, and or career and life coaching. We are structured as a registered investment advisor, known as an RIA. We're regulated by the SEC, and with our organization, we are fee only. Charles Schwab & Company is our sole custodian, and our main office is in downtown Oakland with a satellite office in Santa Rosa. This month, and this year in particular, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary in business, so we're very proud of that. We currently have a total of 14 employees. We're managing just under $440 million on behalf of all of our clients. And I put a stat here that we're very proud of as well, and that is in 2010, 55% of our new clients were referred by you, our existing clients. We thank you for that. Matthews International Capital Management. They are the largest dedicated Asia investment specialist in the United States, and they've been doing that since their inception in 1991. And they've done that, obviously, through a variety of market environments. They remain independent and privately owned with significant employee ownership, and they happen to have a range of investment strategies across the risk-reward spectrum. What makes them unique is they do offer an investment perspective with the Asian markets, but from their strategic location in San Francisco. They're managing a total of $19.1 billion, and as you can see in the left-hand area of the screen, they have regional strategies as a subset of, that, of those monies, covering just over $14 billion, with just under $5 billion, 4.7 to be exact, in single country strategies, with a total of 26 investment team members. So what is decoupling? Andrew? Thank you, Dana. Before I begin, I would like to quickly thank the audience for their interest and participation today. And I would also like to uh, thank uh, and extend my gratitude to the folks at Bell Investment Advisors for the opportunity uh, to join them here and for the privilege of speaking uh, to this audience. Uh, in my remarks today, I'd like to talk about a term, uh, decoupling, uh, that is uh, fairly widely used in some of the financial media today. And uh, it is a very tricky term. It's a, a nebulous term. It's, it's some, to some extent a seductive term. Uh, because it holds out some sort of promise for investors uh, that is difficult uh, to verify or validate. Uh, what is this term? I, I think it, uh, many in the audience may have heard of it, but I would imagine all of you would have different uh, understandings of what this, uh, this term might mean for you and for your investment portfolios. Perhaps the broadest definition I can offer is the idea that there is today in, in the modern world a set of 
uh, economies and markets, particularly emerging markets, that are somehow uh, large enough and broad enough and independent enough in their growth prospects of what is happening in developed markets such as the United States or Europe, that somehow this set of economies might be able to uh, offer differentiated performance to investors even during times of financial distress or crisis or economic uh, downturn. And China probably stands at the fore in, in people's minds as to uh, a market that might be most likely to decouple from the fortunes of Western developed markets. So this is a very interesting idea, and it's, it's, I said it was quite seductive, and it's been the premise for a lot of product pro investment product proliferation and a lot of uh, discussion uh, uh, by the financial media. But it's a tricky term because once that sort of initial seduction uh, fades, uh, I would begin to ask, what does this term really even mean, and how does one measure it, and is there any truth behind it? Uh, the problem with the, the term from my perspective is that, it, or the definition that I just offered, is uh, that it has two glaring omissions. The first is whether this idea of decoupling pertains to financial assets such as stocks and bonds, or whether it pertains to real economies, that is the economic activity uh, that it exists in these countries. Because we all know that stocks and bonds don't necessarily perform uh, fully in line with economic activity. They tend to correlate, but they don't necessarily tend to move in direct tandem with one another. The second issue, and, and an omission from this definition, is whether or not uh, investors uh, might have expectations for decoupling to emerge over short time horizons or over longer ones. There's really no uh, reference in the definition that I offered as to whether or not you would expect decoupling benefits to accrue over a day, over a week, over a month, over, over, over quarters, or even over years and decades. So over what time horizon might one measure decoupling and expect the benefits to accrue if it exists at all? To get to my own feelings on the subject, I want to uh, relate the, the point that in, in 2007, when this term was very much in vogue at a time uh, that uh, the U.S. economy was unfortunately beginning to show some of its own cracks prior to the 2008 downturn, uh, decoupling was uh, very much bandied about in markets on the premise that China might uh, again uh, show economic leadership. At that time, I addressed shareholders of our mutual fund family with the idea that I viewed decoupling as largely a myth. And that was because I wanted to dissuade people from a, a very simplistic understanding of what decoupling might mean for them. I hoped that there might be some uh, latent uh, promise in the term, but I was fearful that people's expectations had uh, grown apart from reality. The reason from this, for this was because I knew, having observed Asia's economies for the better part of a decade, that their growth and their promise was really due to the fact that they had chosen to couple with the rest of the world. India and China and many of the other emerging markets in Asia were once very small, backward, isolated places. And it was because their economies were shuttered and, and cut off from the rest of the world. It was only because they uh, grew more open to trade, to foreign investment, to competition, both domestic and foreign in nature. It was only because they made those difficult choices that their economies began to grow. And so the idea that these economies would suddenly begin to perform in a differentiated fashion, in a decoupled fashion, struck me as, as hoping against both, the reason, both reason, odds, and history. So let's look at what actually happened. Unfortunately, uh, the news wasn't great. Uh, this is the performance of several major stock market indices from around the world between uh, the, really the, the, uh, the, the peak period of the downturn in stock markets that happened between October of 2007 and November of 2008. On the left, in gold, we have the U.S. stock markets in, in the uh, uh, tan color. And uh, next to that, we have a, a global measure of stock market performance. And on the right, we have an Asian regional stock market in blue uh, index. And then we have a Chinese index on the far right. And you can see here that in the downturn itself, uh, the performance of these indices was anything but differentiated. These markets did not hold up any better. In fact, their declines happened faster and were uh, more severe. Uh, than what happened in developed economies around the world. And if I were to show you some of the other crises that had, uh, 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 that had impacted these markets earlier in the decade, for instance, their performance after the technology downturn in 1999 or during the severe acute respiratory syndrome crisis, it was known as SARS, 
that was another period of market correction. These markets performed uh, no better than their developed counterparts. 